Hi, everybody. I have handouts. I have never done handouts before. I've taken handouts, but I've never done handouts. It's nice to have you all here. Holy cow, there's a lot of people here. This is great. And welcome to you upstairs. We, we bid uh, welcome to you. How nice to have a group upstairs, too. Uh, we've got a lot to cover today. Uh, when we're talking about urban renewal in Fairport, I know that for many people, it is a topic of great emotion. And uh, because many people lived it in this community. And so I am very sensitive to that. Um, it's a part of many families' history, many businesses' history, and we'll, we'll talk about that. Hey, Peter, nice to see you. Um, as we go forward. All right. Everybody see okay? I think you can see pretty well with the lights on. Um, here we go. Let's get started. I start right out with a then and now photograph, of course, that you can see very clearly which is the then and which is the now. Thank you. Um, we're going to start by setting the stage a little bit and going back in time to give a bit of an indication of how we got to the point where urban renewal took place in Fairport. And I'm going all the way back to 1954. Something happened at the Rundell Library in Rochester. They had an event called Futurama. And in Futurama, imagine setting the stage. We came out of the Depression and immediately went into World War II. And now we're in the early 1950s, and so many people are ready for a change. There was a lack of investment all across America, including in Rochester, including in Fairport and Parenton. And so people were ready for new ideas. A lot of people, people were ready for change. Architects were ready to draw something that people <laughs> had never seen before. And in that context, we even had a local art architect, Victor Mellon, that I'm researching right now, who did something that was really considered to be exciting at that event. What they did is they, they constructed models of future-looking buildings and neighborhoods and homes and schools. Parents and schools were featured at this 1954 event, and people were excited about looking to the future. In that context, 1954, February 14th, Democrat and Chronicle. The most striking of the layouts is that of a dreamed-up regional shopping center for the Pittsburgh Parenton residents, created as a thesis by Victor Mellon in the office of architect Charles Piot. It's a site for the imagination to feast upon. Features included a round department store, a glass shaft of an office building, a shopping plaza with cars in a locations that you would have never imagined in previous shopping plazas, almost a new word. And so the point here is that there was a lot of excitement with a lot of people to do something new and different. And of course, in many cases, that involved replacing old things. Interesting footnote as we're researching Victor Mellon, who lived in Parenton for decades. It says he, was, uh, he had designed and put on display a round department store. Well, it wasn't a department store, but he put that into action about 20 years later. He's the guy that developed the Columbia Banks. Oh, oh yeah. And we have one of those in Parenton, don't we? Yeah. Pretty revolutionary in its time. Um, along the same lines of thinking forward and not necessarily thinking about what we have, here's a newspaper item from 1964 with Hazelton Chevrolet getting ready to move from their East Rochester site to a new building at the corner of Marsh and Fairport Road. And look at the graphic. It's a fire truck with one of the Hoselton gentlemen here and the chief of the East Rochester Fire Department involved in the advertisement. And the excitement is for the 65 Chevrolets, we're going to have a preview housewarming. But then they go on to explain what this housewarming is. Here's a bigger version. More than a housewarming, actually a house burning. <laughs> when the torch is set next Sunday to the century-old house located on the site of the new Hoselton Chevrolet building. Oh. So imagine, I tell you this to think about what was going on at the time. We're inviting hundreds of people to come witness the destruction of a home that, by the way, was the home of the Benedict family as early as the 1820s. 
at the corner. You know where Hazleton Chevrolet is. Yeah. And you remember the distinctive building, right? The irony is that that's gone too. Here's the house. And this was taken just uh, a few years before it was burned to the ground in this spectacle as part of a sales promotion. Oh, gosh. This is the environment that we are beginning to march toward urban renewal in. Recognize this scene? Anyone remember a big blizzard about 1966? Everyone knows where you were, if you in fact were at that time. So here we are looking north on South Main Street. Here's our lift bridge, a marooned truck unable to cross the bridge. And I show it to you because it's a great picture, but now we'll put it in the context of urban renewal because uh, a little more than 10 years later, all of this was gone and all of this was gone. Um, this was written in the Fairport newspaper in 1966, and it's a relevant quote. Can Fairport merchants continue to attract business from a rapidly expanding populace in outlying subdivisions and from present villagers when faced with increasing competition from nearby shopping centers? And this is very much what a lot of the story was about. Parenton was growing like crazy. 1950 population, 11,500. By 1970, almost tripled in 20 years to just about 32,000. Now for reference, we're at 47,000. So that population was growing like crazy. And imagine, as all these neighborhoods were being developed in the outskirts around the village of Fairport, north, south, east, and west, these developments of the late 50s, 60s, and 70s, most of these people that came here that make up this enormous population growth, they weren't from Fairport. They weren't customers of the shops and stores in the village of Fairport. And at the same time, shopping plazas were being built. Panorama Plaza, Country Club Plaza. In the late 50s and in the early 60s and then the 70s, all around us. So these merchants in Fairport, struggling with all this, you would think, what a good problem to have. 20, 30,000 more people living in our community. Yes, but they're shopping in all of these places. The Wegmans Plaza, the old Wegmans Plaza at the corner of Mosley, we're talking about where uh, uh, Applebee's is? Yeah. Uh, Parenton Square. I posted yesterday to show the popularity of the history in this range, the 70s, when Parenton Square was built. I did a post yesterday on the Facebook pages that I populate. Anybody see it? Um, with seven or eight photos of interior shots and out exterior shots. Uh, in one day, it's up to 20,000 people that have seen it. And so many people are commenting. You know, it really tells you, though, history is very much a contextual thing. When did you grow up? Where did you grow up? And that's what's important to you. The candy store you went to when you were a kid. The ice cream shop that you went to after the ball game. Let's not forget Pittsburgh Plaza was blossoming at the same time. And look at that traffic. <laughs> Meanwhile, during urban renewal, one of Fairport's biggest concern was too much traffic. It's a, real, it's a real conflict. We don't have enough customers, but we don't want all this traffic. <laughs> and at the same time, the big one, Eastview Mall, opened in 1971. Which, for those of you that are taxpayers uh, now, you will probably always remember that that was supposed to be in Parenton. <laughs> okay, urban renewal just didn't happen in Fairport. I had someone ask me recently, why did Fairport have urban renewal if it's urban? Well, urban doesn't mean it was, it was uh, only taking place in cities. It happened in cities, it happened in suburbs, it happened in small towns. Um, I've got some newspaper items here from Hornell. This is about Fairport, but East Rochester. Uh, Newark. Newark was a big one, yes. Many, many communities uh, far and wide were really impacted by urban renewal. So, our story. Our story with urban renewal actually starts in 1962. And in this case, this is actual minutes from a village board meeting in uh, January 11th, 1962. And in this case, they invited, 
A special guest, Kurt Moore, field representative of the House Housing and Home Finance Agency, to talk about the opportunities for urban renewal. And it says in the Village Minutes, a tour of the village made in the afternoon revealed certain areas which would qualify as urban renewal projects. And now, this is where the surprise comes, because it isn't the urban renewal that we know happened. In this January 62 version, they looked at the south side of High Street, just a little stretch, North Main Street from Parse Avenue to about uh, uh, Thomas Creek, and then the north and south side of West Avenue, that did happen, between Main Street and Perrin Street. That was it. That was all that was involved with urban renewal. I've got an aerial photograph showing you those shaded areas that were considered. And I'll show you some pictures, too. That was the whole stretch of what we were talking about. Um, the south side of High Street, it was just these two buildings. This one you might recognize. It's often referred to as the first Catholic church of Fairport. Uh, when it wasn't being a Catholic church, it served as a grain and feed store <laughs> during the week. <laughs> this barn, because we can't pass up talking about history, this barn never would have been in this potential urban renewal plan if it hadn't previously been moved to this spot from Brooks Hill, 200 South Main Street, where the Brooks lived. 1925, the barn was moved all the way down across the bridge and put here. And it, both of these buildings are still here today, not lost to urban renewal. Also on that 1962 idea for urban renewal was this west side of North Main Street from Parse Avenue down to the creek. So all of these buildings along here. You know, let's take a look at a little video from 1938, just to get you in the mood. One of the reasons why I want to show you this, besides the fact that it's really cool, is that you can get a feel for what life was like in Fairport way so long ago. This is, okay, let's set the stage. This building right here is uh, Recreational Vehicles and Equipment, RV&E. This is the tracks by RV&E. Uh, Main Street is right here. Everybody with me? It's only about 10 seconds long. 1938. I did not ask them where it came from. <laughs> This film was taken by Bob Kramer, uh, who uh, we were fortunate enough to get some films such as this from the family and have them digitized. Bob uh, graduated from Fairport in 1937. He and uh, Leona Sharp, who went to high school together, married. Maybe you remember the story that was on CBS Evening News, picked up by the National News. Uh, they married. Uh, she went off to Bausch & Lam. He went off to Kodak. He got in the labs and started working with experimental color film. They sent those guys home with cameras and say shoot some film, that's what we're looking at. So they could refine their color home movie process in 1938. A few years later, Bob went off to war, learned how to fly a, a, a bomber. He lost control of that plane, they were shot down, half the crew died, half the crew was missing in action. Bob was missing in action, determined dead five years later. Um, a remarkable story, found Leona uh, just a few years ago, before she passed away, uh, knocked on her door, and I said, um, I have these films, and they're your life. Uh, because he really filmed Leona in so many of the films. And she shut the door, and I thought, well, that didn't go well. <laughs> she was 90-some-odd years old at the time, and then she came back. I hadn't walked away yet. I was stunned. And she came back a minute later holding her wedding photograph of she and Bob because they got married before he went off to war and he never came back. Oh. So um, she wound up uh, being broadcast all across America. It was kind of nice. But back to our story, because I'm supposed to be talking about urban renewal. Um, so here we are by this time in um, 1965, and these plans are continually evolving and changing over time. So they published a map, which is almost impossible to understand, uh, because 
there's no shading or no coloring to speak of, but they were working out the plan for urban renewal. And some of the words that they used in this plan are interesting. The objectives, to modernize the business district, placing major emphasis on an enlarged municipal building. Okay, they're talking about Village Hall, which was the Village Hall and the Town Hall at that time. And the exploitation of the picturesque potential of the Barge Canal. Yeah. Number two, create a larger industrial area on the north side of the Barge Canal. And three, reduce the through traffic problem. <laughs> by creating a new roadway, a new roadway, running along the north bank of the Barge Canal. This would take the place of the current 31F. What they're talking about, as near as I can imagine, I see some lines drawn here. They're talking about, you've got 31F up here, come down here, and then don't cross the canal, take basically the towpath, which would lead you to eventually Fairport Road. <laughs> Didn't happen. Finally, make an all-out effort to preserve village charm and atmosphere during the urban renewal process. Revitalize the business district, making a strong effort to get those federal monies that were really driving urban renewal. Because you see, with urban renewal, two-thirds of the money would come from the federal government. One-sixth would come from state government, one-sixth from village government. So there was a tremendous financial incentive to try to get some of this money for a lot of folks. Uh, this is a map of what that 1965 area would look like, and it looks very much like what did wind up happening several years later. This is based on an old Sanborn insurance map. That's what I use. So we're looking at Main Street, West Avenue, those of you that haven't been around forever in a day may not know that West Avenue actually intersected with Main Street at the lift bridge until urban renewal came and really made some changes and we put a beautiful park in there. Uh, also the areas on the east side of Main Street uh, and behind Village Hall and including Village Hall, part of the urban renewal plan at this time. Here is a map that shows that area shaded all the areas that we're talking about that were targeted for urban renewal by this point in time, 1965, 1966. Isn't it great we have all these great aerial photographs? We had a gentleman who lived in the community that was a professional aerial photographer, so that helped that we have a lot of coverage. And when you live in a community, by the way, that has a railroad and has a canal, there's always a lot of government pictures too. Part of the impetus for all of this, part of the rationale for urban renewal in Fairport was what was seen as just a terrible combination of grade level railroad crossings with a lift bridge that was very undependable, <laughs> especially by today's standards. And I've read so many things and talked to people who were around back in those days who would say sometimes the lift bridge would be stuck in the up position for hours at a time. <laughs> Imagine. Now also imagine that this is before Turk Hill Road became a viable alternative. The bridge that we have today hasn't always existed. There was a one-lane canal bridge and there were two grade level crossings of the railroad. Oh. Pardon? <laughs> and so it was treacherous at best. So grade level crossings were an issue and repairs and breakdowns of the trains. We're not, we haven't escaped all of that yet. And then in addition, the lift bridge. Now, just to give you a, a snippet of prevailing views by some back in the 60s, a prominent writer, and by I, prominent I mean a weekly writer to the Fairport newspaper, whose letters were published virtually weekly, in one of his essays wrote, it's time for the old ladies of the Parenton Historical Society <laughs> to stop making love to that rusty bucket of bolts we call a lift bridge. <laughs> the bridge was far less dependable than today, and it was part of this recipe of traffic that didn't move very well. And again, I can't emphasize enough, 
without the changes to Turk Hill Road that happened later, there really weren't other good options. So we're up to 1968 now, and an annual report, because now we, we've been going with urban renewal since 1962. We're into six years of a project, and people assigned to teams, and a commission, and, and some paid staff. And so in their annual report, they came up with a plan A, a plan B, and a plan C. <clears throat> plan A was the rerouting of Main Street to the east. Rerouting of Main Street to the east, utilizing Main Street then as a walkway, a pedestrian area. There was more to it, creating a municipal complex in the western portion of the area. Um, it says it was a popular uh, option, however it was deemed uh, impossible because of the costs. There was a plan B, assuming Main Street would remain in its present condition or location, Commercial activity would be grouped on the west side of Main Street, perhaps in a covered mall, a traditional mall, and um, that the east side would be reserved for a municipal complex. Remember that. Plan C, and that was deemed un unlikely to succeed because of traffic issues, they said, and parking issues. Plan C, so important, so monumental, I've made a big version of it. <laughs> this is based on the assumption that the village and the state will see through to the completion of the grade elimination, the two railroad, two railroad crossings, by the way, you realize it was the crossings we have today, and you know where all that parking we complain there isn't enough up by the can factory? Pardon me, the cannery. Um, there were railroad tracks there. That was the second family of tracks. Those were actually the original tracks. So you had crossings within a short distance of each other and a lift bridge a little bit further south. And if you wanted to add to the fun, way back from 1906 to 1931, there was also a trolley crossing. <laughs> anyway, see to the completion of the railroad crossings, bridging the canal and the tracks with one continuous span. To do this, Main Street would gradually be elevated to a height of five feet greater than the present at the south end of the bridge. I read that and I think, how could it not have been more than five feet? Because you had to accommodate those highest boats. I think they're mistaken. <laughs> so this was a plan that was favored. That continuous span I have illustrated for you on this, holy moly, this is High Street, Main Street, this is Pleasant Street. That bridge would have gone from High Street to Pleasant Street. How many of you think you would still live here if that bridge <laughs> had been put into place? Perhaps not. So that was the plan. You might be surprised to find that there were a fair amount of people that thought this was a terrific plan. It had a lot of support at the time. In fact, I don't want to. I don't want to just say that without backing it up. <laughs> Anybody hear of Hawk Derizio? <laughs> well, if you haven't heard of Hawk Derizio, Hawk, Fairport legend, ran Hawk's restaurant, and by all accounts, one of our most beloved citizens. Um, Hawk said, "I could have won mayor." any time I wanted to, I could have been mayor. The problem is I didn't want to lose half my friends. <laughs> I'm sure plenty of politicians and former politicians and wannabe politicians can appreciate that statement. <laughs> um, Hawk went to a public meeting on this topic of choosing these selections, A, B, C, one, two, three, and he went to the meeting and he didn't speak. He said, instead he would write a letter. I walked out of the middle of the urban renewal meeting. I wasn't angry with anybody, but I just had so much to say that it would have taken too much time. I decided to put my opinion in writing. I'm just going to read you a couple of snippets. He went on to say, one gentleman suggested, merchants should just renovate and remodel their own stores. This to me is, the, in most cases, is like wearing brand new shoes over dirty socks. <laughs> I admit a few buildings can be remodeled, but most of the buildings are rotted to the point 
where they would have to tear them right down to the framework, et cetera, et cetera. If renewal is improved, the proposed bridge will eliminate all our traffic problems. <laughs> now, this was not an isolated view at the time. So it's a complex topic. And it's most complex, I feel, for the people who owned those buildings, lived in those buildings, and houses, of which there were many, that were sacrificed in urban renewal, or had a building and a business and a house, and saw that much more impact on their families and their lives. So a three-dimensional model was built. And you could go down to the urban renewal offices and see the model. Here is a photograph of it for you from a shabby newspaper page, but I can do better than that. I can show you photos of the actual model that have turned up recently, which was termed bold in concept. <laughs> so sometimes it's hard to tell which way we're looking. I would say in this photograph, we're looking off to the east, so the Parker Street Bridge would be up there in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, Village Hall would be over here. The models don't depict everything. Um, Does that replace the bridge? Is that this is part of the flyover bridge that would go from Pleasant Street to High Street. It would eliminate the bucket of bolts. It would eliminate the rusty bucket of bolts <laughs> and, been, and, and cause the Historical been. Society ladies to move on. Yes. <laughs> Pardon me? Is that on Main Street? Is that this is Main Street. Oh, that is Main Street. This is Main Street. Here, it appears to me, we are looking west. So these buildings are these buildings. Here's a few more views. Of yes. So, a lot to think about. In the meantime, it wasn't just buildings on Main Street and West Avenue. It was houses, many houses. And I'm going to show you quite a few of them. An article started to be written about, wait a minute, shouldn't we be preserving? Shouldn't we be trying to save these places? Here are two prominent houses on South Main Street, looking towards the bridge, all these buildings. And so we have the uh, Wagner House and what I'll call the Pitnero House. Of course, those were the last two owners. Uh, that would be Frank Pitnero and his family and uh, Judge Bob Wagner and his wife, Winnie. And um, both important in many ways. This house in particular, for many people who thought it was maybe Fairport's best opportunity to save a landmark. 1972, some different senses come out of the Urban Renewal Committee and the community. In this case, one of the members of the Urban Renewal Committee started to draw a different vision. And here is a street side view of an urban renewal plan that included some of the old building. That's the Bound Building. Here's a bigger view of it. Here's the Bound Building. Here are some examples where they've saved some in this drawing, perhaps a mix of old and new. Here is another drawing, and this by Leonard Rosenberg used to live on Dewey Avenue, and he was on Urban Renewal Agency for Fairport, and he was an architect. And he drew this vision of Fairport. And I find it very intriguing. Here we are in 1972. The lift bridge is still here in this vision. Old buildings. There's the Bound Building, I believe. Village Hall is still here. Haven't taken that down. By the way, we never did take that down, right? <laughs> and a mix of buildings. And look what we see here. The Wagner House, which for reference, the Wagner House was exactly where the drive-in is to get to Packett's Landing off of Main Street, right next to the bank, immediately north of the bank. Oh. And yet, in this whimsical image, it has been put up put in a park along the canal, picked up and moved. And there was talk about picking it up and moving it. Here's a closer view of that. And I've, I've colored the old buildings here so you get an idea. Here is the, the bank, by the way. Uh -huh. So you can see that there was some, some uh, counter views to demolish everything, take it all down. 
However, when we talk about Mr. Rosenberg, I don't think he was on the committee much longer. I don't know if that is a coincidence. I don't know if there was conflict within the committee with regard to these different viewpoints, seriously. But um, I've talked to a lot of people today who have said, well, if we had this to do over again, it's always, you know, you always say that and you think, well, of course we don't. But if we did, could we have saved the, saved the facades of some of these buildings and built behind them? But put it in the context of that house being b burned to the ground yes. as part of a show, yeah. right? Yeah. That's not how most people were thinking. Can we save the front of these buildings? So 1972 concept, here is that Wagner house and here it is. Look at it, clearly that's what we're talking about. Um, data was taken, studies were done by engineers for the commercial buildings on South Main Street and West Avenue. They were done in 1972, engineers report um, for all of these buildings. Now, I'm gonna target one of them, uh, Rudin's store. Anybody ever go to Rudin's? Of course you did. Probably some good memories in Rudin's. And you know, you remember it as Rudin's. Your parents or your grandparents or your great-grandparents would remember it as something else. They might remember it as being where they went and had Dr. Trescott pull out a tooth. <laughs> so here are three different views of that building going way, way, way back. The engineering report for Rudin's 1972 was lengthy. I'm just giving you a little bit at the end. They would need to install restrooms on the first floor. It would need all new heating, electrical, new roof. The second floor was a disaster regrade the exterior surfaces so all the water isn't running into the building, complete renovation of the exterior of the building. In our opinion, the building has a short-term life expectancy less than eight years. <laughs> this opinion is based on a lack of structural soundness and general poor quality of the entire structure and not on the aesthetics. This is the part that bothers me. Which are lacking even to the most discriminating eye. <laughs> We were being so good at being objective. <laughs> so this study for the Rudin's building is not representative of all of them. Some of the engineering studies showed that the buildings were in good shape. Pitnero's shoe store, that building was kept up well, and we know that the Pitnero's put a lot of money into that building and maintained it well, and there were others as well. Uh, Henry Misangelo owned a building which fronted both on South Main Street and went as an L over to West Avenue. And he took terrific care and plowed a lot of money into those buildings. But picture yourself owning one of these buildings and hearing as early as 1962 that you may be paid federal dollars, regardless of what you want to happen, mm -hmm. in compensation for the demolition of your building you are going to be unlikely to put money into that building. Also remember, I started out by talking about the Depression and then World War II, both of which over time, over decades, took their toll on the physical inventory of this village, both houses and commercial buildings. They started to really catalog what money would be coming in for urban renewal. And at this point, by 1975, as hearings were planned and we're working our way towards really getting concrete support from the federal government. Uh, some of it came in the, uh, was projected to come as the form of loans, but mostly as simply grants, millions and millions of dollars. Um, now, despite the fact that years earlier, we picked between plan A, B, and C, and they selected C as the option, the flyover bridge. Now, all the way off in 1975, years later, we've gone with plan one, plan two, and plan three. Plan one was the elimination of the grade crossings, including the lift bridge, the flyover bridge. Plan two, elimination of the grade crossings only, and leave the lift bridge. Plan three, elimination of the grade crossing only, with the consolidation of the railroad tracks, the two family of tracks, and leave the bridge. So two out of the three options left the lift bridge. That must be what happened. No. 
they pick, they pick plan one. And the village board voted, and as you can see from the actual village board minutes, four to one voted for plan one, the flyover bridge. Now imagine this is consulting with their constituents, consulting the data, making the best decision they felt that they could make. They chose four to one to take that flyover bridge, eliminate the lift bridge, and eliminate what was, anytime you have a grade level crossing, there's increased safety concerns to a non-grade level crossing of the railroad. I mean, that's just a fact. Mayor McDonough was the lone holdout. Despite the fact that he didn't get his way, the uh, message was sent on to the DOT, to the state, Department of Transportation. The village clerk was instructed to contact the state and the authorities that the village favors plan one, the flyover bridge. Having said that, <laughs> just a month later, after a letter was written communicating that to the village, we find out that in July of 75, maybe you remember a gentleman named Napoleon Mancuso. <laughs> Business man on the north side, which by the way, a fair amount of our north side residents felt shortchanged that they didn't get urban renewal. Why does everything go to the south side? <laughs> Why does all the money go to the south side? And it was really a viewpoint of quite a few folks sure. at the time. Given that, however, Mr. Mancuso objected at a village board meeting. And he said he appeared to question why a referendum is being scheduled on the November ballot, village-wide ballot, to vote on the plan for the grade crossing elimination and the removal of the lift bridge. So why are you having a referendum? You already picked it and communicated to the state. You want option one. Um, the mayor, uh, he asked the mayor to retract his statement about all that. Mayor McDonough thanked Mr. Mancuso for stating his opinion. <laughs> now, something more was going on here. This is July of 1975. We know Mayor McDonough did not want this flyover bridge. Suddenly, by December 10th, 1975, New York State nixes the flyover bridge. They pulled the funding for the bridge. I suspect, and I am grateful for it, that our, our good mayor had his ear to the ground and was aware, probably couldn't talk it up too much, but he was aware that the threat of this flyover bridge uh, would disappear. And we'd find some other solutions. So this was out, and we kept our lift bridge. We better figure out how to, how to make it work for us. By the way, have you ever had to wait for the lift bridge? <laughs> Raise your hand if you've never had to wait for the lift bridge. I will tell you what I've told every fourth grader in Fairport for the last 10 years or so. Next time you have to wait for the lift bridge and your father, mother, aunt, uncle, cousin says, oh, I can't stand this bridge. I hate waiting for this bridge. You kids, you fourth graders, speak up and say, well, let me tell you what our town historian told us. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln came across these railroad tracks twice. <laughs> once after he was inaugurated on his way to Washington, D.C., and once, sadly, on his funeral train. So, Mom, Dad, think about that. <laughs> that kid's not getting ice cream on that trip. All right, here's a view of 1928 Canal Fairport showing the lumber yards along the south side. Ever been to Porterhouse Restaurant or uh, my, what is it, my wine bar? Or? That's the place. Right here, Dudley Lumber Yards and other lumber yards there for 125, 150 years. That's what we're looking at. Here's what it looks like in this 1969 aerial photograph. The remnants of it's still there. There's the back of the village hall and the police department. Everybody know where we are? Okay, um, Parker Street Bridge. Um, I'm going to show you some scenes of what was impacted. Here's a real early picture looking south on South Main Street. Dirt road, wooden plank sidewalks crossing the street. 
inexplicably, trolley tracks going down the center of the road for a trolley that was never built. It was on speculation, a trolley company put their tracks there. Uh, that was about 19, three, four, five, somewhere around there. Uh, terrific picture, wasn't it? This is an image of South Main Street, and we are looking, here is the Wagner Building. In this photograph, it was only about 100 years old. Um, some of the buildings that were lost to urban renewal on both sides. Iconic photograph from, I think it's about 1932 or so. And, oh, got time for one more movie? <laughs> Again, from Mr. Bob Kramer. A lot of nice cars for people that are fighting through the Depression. You will see in a, in a moment the intersection of West Avenue there uh, at the tail end. Right there. Okay, here's North Main Street, and we are looking from the Main Street Bridge, roughly 1906, 1907. We know that because the trolley was uh, begun in 1906. This is before we even had a trolley station. So looking off down North Main Street to the north. Here's a picture of West Avenue. You can see the lift bridge right at the end of West Avenue. So what we're looking at here today would be Canale Park. Here's a picture looking across the canal from approximately our beautiful new restrooms at the... Well, there's no window, so you'd have to be outside the restroom. Uh, at West Avenue, and this is South Main Street. So it's hard to pick out a little context here, but um, th this, this building was on the south corner of West Avenue. This building starts on the north side of West Ham, so you would drive between these buildings. Okay. But, I mean, when you look at this, wow. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> here are the same buildings in about 1962, looking down where Canale Park is today, and here is West Avenue and what would be the park today, Canale Park. Uh, down here, right down here. In fact, they took this building down to build Moonlight Creamery. What about the brick oven pizza? The brick oven pizza. You know, it is inevitable that the first pizza place that you went to in your life is the best pizza you ever had. Here's another view of those West Avenue buildings. And, and if you know, <laughs> best pizza, I can taste the pizza. <laughs> you notice there's no glass in these windows, um, in, in most of them. That's because this is an auction that's taking place a few days after arsonists burned the place, which was a few days before it was going to be torn down for urban renewal. But uh, here is Vince Canale, uh, another local legend and auctioneer. And this is West Avenue. Now we're looking at the south side of West Avenue in a very old photo perhaps 1880s or 1890. You know there's a congregational church on so, uh, uh, East Church Street, yeah. right? Con big, beautiful, brick congregational church. This is the first congregational church. Well, actually, the second, because the brick one is the third. This was picked up and moved onto West Avenue to build the existing church. And look at those church windows. So what this became was Shaw's Hall. It was the community center of the day back when community centers were private buildings. So just to give you a glimpse of what was going on in West Avenue, here's that same building in about 1914. We're looking at the south side of um, West Avenue. The lift bridge would be right down here. And here are some of the homes and buildings that were also on West Avenue. Um, these all on the south side. Uh, 
Dr. Whitney's dentist office. Have you ever had a tooth pulled there? It's the second dentist I've mentioned tonight. <laughs> now, Perrin Street also suffered from urban renewal. And directly across from where we are tonight, you'll notice there is a green grass berm leading to the parking lot. Well, several houses were torn down. Oh. One, two, three, four, five. Five houses on Perrin Street. And these houses uh, look pretty good. Here they are. Maury Razabek. Charlotte Clapp, uh, first town historian, town clerk for years. And let's not forget the Hooker House. And just for clarity, that was their last name. Uh, Hooker's uh, One Horse Grocery is what it was. And they had a store on West Avenue that just about backed up to their house. And here's a terrific picture of the DeLand Band in front of that home. And here, it's amazing what you can find out here, father and son of the Hooker family with all the fish they caught out there at Soda's Bay one day. Oh my gosh. The little one horse grocery, 21 West Avenue, that's the place we're talking about there. There's history behind all of these places. In total, 13 houses, 28 buildings is a rough number that I've been able to come up with that were uh, destroyed for urban renewal. Um, it spanned a number of years. 76 was a big year for it. Uh, Village Hall is standing here. If you're wondering why there's trucks and station wagons here, it's because people were encouraged to come and get materials. You could come and get loads of bricks. Uh, I mentioned uh, Auctioneer Canale. He and a little team of folks put values, prices, so that you could buy things. And those prices were cheap. I talked to one gentleman, maybe he's here, who told me he bought basically a whole stairway for a few dollars, old stairway from an old building, and houses. People took home bricks and they built sidewalks and fireplaces. Yeah. And in a way, it's kind of nice that those buildings lead, lead, uh, live on in different ways around the community. Now, we start to see some of the destruction. It pains me to even show you these, but I think you want me to. Um, some South Main Street, uh, Scenes, the Clark Building, which was only built in 1910. This building was only 60 years old. Uh, I talked about the Pit and Arrow Building, uh, Pit and Arrow House, and um, people get people will correct me. They'll say, "Well, wait a minute. I know the Pit and Arrows. They lived on West Church Street or other house." Well, there was a lot of Pit and Arrows. <laughs> so I'm referring to the family of Frank Pit and Arrow who bought this house, and in their building, which is right there, Tony's shoe store, that half of that building, well, Pitner always owned that building. So they had a store. They had four apartments upstairs. Family lived in those three apartments, and a lady who took care of tons of those kids in the Pitner family lived in the fourth apartment. And then they had the house. Beautiful house. Yeah. And why was a house that was built in about 1885, why was that prime real estate available in the heart of the village of Fairport at that time? That's because when they built this, they picked up two houses that were, a house that was there, cut it in half, and moved it to 8 and 12 George Street. Oh, oh, yeah. You've heard me talked about moved houses before. This is a picture of Civil War veterans and their wives outside of this house, right against this wall that we can't see, the north-facing wall. Aww. So photographs help us to retain the memory and retain the stories. Anyone ever live in this house? I, did. I had a feeling. <laughs> because generations of people live in these places and have memories of these places. Oh, yeah. Stand. Oh, Standing from the roof, standing from the balcony of the village hall, taking pictures of the destruction. Uh, I'm thankful we have the record, but it makes me kind of sick. Um, the Wagner House, um, owned 
Before the Wagners by Dr. George Price and his wife, Elizabeth Days Devendorf Price. <laughs> and um, one thing I'm really thankful for is when Dr. Wa uh, Judge Wagner and his wife bought this house, just before that, in about 1950, there was a tag sale or an auction at this house. Maybe you've heard me go on and on about these glass plate negatives that were discovered. Oh, yeah. Found in this house a crate of glass plate negatives with images of our community. And they were rescued and tucked underneath a chair on Woodlawn Avenue on the Woodlawn Bed and Breakfast until my wife happened to go there to visit family and this lady pulled it out from under a chair and said, take this home to your husband. <laughs> yes! So this house that so many people really spent a lot of energy, letters to the editor, um, uh, ideas and brainstorming and pleading to move it to various sites. I was told recently that someone told me uh, there's a lot. When you go down West Church Street, turn on Fifth Avenue, and Fifth Avenue takes a hard turn, right? And then comes out on Nelson. Well, on that hard turn, there's an empty lot down there. And whoever owned that lot back in the day said, you can put that house there. Of course, the thing with moving a structure is if people don't want it to happen, it's going to cost an unbelievable amount of money. <laughs> if people want it to happen, they say, oh, we can do that. <laughs> so with all of the destruction and with the ground cleared for construction of new buildings, groundbreaking was set August 1976, 28th of August, and this vision of the landing mall and a return to village life. You see, there was a perception among quite a few folks that our shops were underpopulated with customers. Our business owners, many of them, were really struggling. The suburbs were growing like crazy. The shopping plazas were booming. And Fairport was dying was the perception of many. And of course, there was exceptions to that and examples where it was very true. And so... The idea of getting back to village life, while it sounds perhaps crazy, you just tore down the village, <laughs> but on the other hand, for many people, it was an opportunity for, to be reborn, to have a new, a new life and, and new investment of millions of dollars. Coming soon, a grocery store, a real grocery store. No matter how much maybe your, you liked or your parents liked the neighborhood stores, so many of them that existed, Here's construction. Now we are looking from about the Main Street Bridge. We're looking down West Avenue where the park would be built. But here is the parking garage going up. Here's your pizza, uh, brick oven pizza. And um, so construction begins. Here we're looking across. Village Hall is still here. So you see it wasn't torn down during urban renewal. But we'll talk about that in a moment too. And now we see buildings springing forth. We're in the parking lot out here. The entrance to the underground garage would be about there. In fact, there it is. And you know, here's Opie Taylor. And even in a short amount of time, like 45 years, it's amazing how things have changed. Today, you know, this kid couldn't get near this construction site. Here's a guy up on a 40-foot wooden ladder with a kid walking underneath him. And everything's good. Here we are building along South Main Street. Here we are in the basement of this building right now for perspective. And wow, a lot going on here. We're looking south on South Main Street. There's our ever-present First Baptist Church steeple. Have you ever noticed it bends a little bit yeah. to the east? I, st I still get phone calls that say, Bill, something's happened to the steeple. It's, <laughs> it's leaning to the east. And I say, well, let me show you a picture I have from 1922 where it's leaning to the east. But you can see in this photograph that the east side buildings have not yet been torn down. So it helps to give us a timeline. We already have new construction to the west, but not yet on the east. Another scene that shows some of that. And the library was part of the plan. Building a new library on the site that eventually would be the Fairport Fire Department on East Church Street. 
but before the fire department, it was planned for the library in a modern scene, which is uh, your word, not mine, uh, <laughs> reminiscent perhaps of the Parenton Town Hall um, by the same architect, yeah. Yeah. initial uh, Bud DeWolf. This would be this would be seventy six or so. The plan by oh seventy two. Oh yeah, good seventy two. Uh, but by nineteen seventy eight, March eleventh, anybody help carry books and materials? Did you? Do you see yourselves? Because the contents of this building were picked up by human beings and carried to the new library that you know today, which is right here. And so that was a pretty neat act of, of volunteerism and contributing to your community. Bill, does anyone here know how the library from West Avenue School was transferred to Minerva Delian? You do. But who else? <laughs> they don't by students. <laughs> Those kids were handed a pile of books and told to start walking. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the, thank you very much, one of the other schools when we moved books, I have photographs of school buses and kids. They loaded the buses with books and kids. It's one way to get an education. All right, here's an aerial view of the new packets landing, as you can see, and still, this side of the street, the east side, has not been impacted yet. Thankfully, our lift bridge survived. And um, so you can see the 24-hour-a-day Topps Market. Another view. So it's been there a long time now. So we've talked about how history is very contextual. There are plenty of people who are not here today that are... 25, 35, 40 years old, this is their history. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is what they remember. This is what they would say, well, don't let anything happen to that. <laughs> uh, canal side development, wrapping up, not too much left to go. Here we are uh, during the urban renewal period. You can see packets landing along here, but the canal hasn't been developed yet on the south side of the canal between the two bridges. And here is a scene from 1979 looking at preparing for that development. There's a sign saying, here it comes. And um, this is an image from 1978, shows you know, the entrance from Parker Street, which we use all the time, right, to get into those uh, restaurants and different venues, the back of Village Hall. And here's what it looks like more today, so no surprise there. However, there was a plan, oh boy, you think you've heard everything. <laughs> there was a plan. You know, it never seems to change. We need housing for the elderly, and we need a lot of other things. We needed a village hall, it was said, a new village hall. We needed to combine it with a town hall, and we also needed to combine it with a community center. Wouldn't that be great? And while we're at it, let's make 100 senior apartments. <laughs> <laughs> Many of our community churches banded together to make a proposal, and they still do this today, and they do a lot of wonderful things. Parenton churches have, have come together and really created some developments and some wonderful housing for some folks. This was their first stab at it, at a 20-story building. <laughs> a 20-story building. Now... 1967, this was proposed, 1967. Imagine, first of all, if you're the town of Parenton saying, is this what we want? And where would this be? Boom, boom, boom. Right there. Oh, man. I hired a high-end graphic artist to show you what it might look like. <laughs> I don't, I don't think I appreciate the laughter. <laughs> but that's about 20 stories when you do the math. Imagine in Fairport, people got pretty wound up about a four-story condo building and a four-story apartment building. Well, 
this plan was, was passed along to the town of Parenton for consideration and for hopefully them getting on board and saying, yeah, we'd like to do a study to look at that as well. What I found in the uh, documentation from that era is the town was quickly propelled to say, maybe we should think about buying some farmland. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what they did not so long after at the corner of Turk Hill and Aral Road. Uh, in the meantime, eight, 1981, urban renewal was still marching forth, still wasn't done yet. Packets landing, village landing were constructed, but there was still two houses that the general manager of Fairport Urban Renewal was interested in. And here we are, the Parker Street Bridge. There's two little houses that are right there. Um, you've never seen them before, probably, but they were uh, 16 Parker Street and 20 Parker Street. These two little houses were torn down that late, 1981. And there is a building as you enter from Parker Street, the parking lot there on the left. You know, good, viable commercial property and office building. I mean, these are, these are useful buildings. I never see for rent buildings on any of those office buildings. Uh, this is the back of that area when all of this was under construction. Here we are, finally, we have our waterway um, enhancements with the docks and the waters. You know, people continually call Fairport. Even outside of Fairport, they call Fairport the jewel. Yes. It would be one thing if we were doing all the talking, right? <laughs> So here we are in 1921, and here's a more recent view. We live in a pretty darn good community. There's a lot of good things happening here. Urban renewal took its toll. Many of those buildings were in pretty rough shape. Not all of them were. It was a challenge for the community, for the building owners, for the residents to have $5 million put in front of us in a community where many things were deteriorating over decades and to not think about taking advantage of that. Uh, remember CB radios? <laughs> Interesting, we would use a CB radio to get the word out that Fairport Village Days is going to be established. That's the predecessor to our Canal Days. Village Days came about as the grand opening for the new Fairport. And here we are in the Canal Park that was the first name of Canali Park. With our brand new gazebo, we still have our little manufacturing building over yeah. there. And uh, here is the wife of Vince Canali, and she's admiring and uh, appreciating the dedication that took place for her family's um, contributions and her husband's contributions. And the name did change to Vincent G. Canale Memorial Park. Well, this happened in 1976. I think this would have been, when did Vince pass away? I can't read it. I, I want to say it was more like 1979, but I'm not sure. I know he did an auction in 86. Really? Hmm. We'll look up, we'll look that up. Been a thriving venue ever since this park. Uh, when you imagine the number of people that participate in that, Canal Days came forth from Village Days. And even, you know, even in this image, which, what does it say, 1990, the street's not closed down. Remember early Canal Days, traffic whizzing by. <laughs> Don't step off the sidewalk. Things change over time. Here's an image from a few years ago, and this is a pretty regular scene in the summer on Thursday nights. You know, those Thursday night concerts at Canale Park have been going on since the park opened, since the summer after the ribbon cutting for the park. Some of our traditions, the farmer's market, the same story, started virtually immediately after urban renewal. We have had a lot of things happen in recent years including the improval of the shoreline of the canal, uh, uh, our timeline and sidewalk that opens up the village of Fairport to neighborhoods that include Roselawn Avenue and West Avenue and West Street and beyond Fifth Avenue and Fourth Avenue. And this picture doesn't depict it, but all the improvements that have been made on the north side of the canal since. And did you know we still have an urban renewal agency? 
and they are doing good things. You're probably familiar, you've seen the signs for the front porch grants, and they have improved so many homes and given people an opportunity to take porches. One of my favorite projects, when people consider taking an enclosed porch and opening it back up again, and giving that house the, the ambiance that it had when it was built, Home loans to income eligible homeowners for repairs and improvements. Financing for multifamily homeowners. All of this under the, the uh, umbrella of uh, Fairport Urban Renewal today and grants for senior uh, and disabled homeowners. HUD housing vouchers for folks that really need a helping hand. So a lot of good things happen from Urban Renewal still today. And our village is a pretty good place. Yeah. <laughs> that lift bridge uh, didn't go away, and what really alleviated all the traffic was the Turk Hill flyover bridge, the right place for it, which happened in about 1981, 1982. A couple of pictures to wrap up from a friend of mine, Nikki Bittner, if you've seen some of her photographs. I asked her if I could share a couple of her images because I don't know if there's a more photographed place on the Erie Canal yeah. than the village of Fairport. <laughs> and that's a credit to this community and people who have led it in the past and lead it today. And so um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's always been a terrific place, but I think we still have a pretty nice community to live in here. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank you. I see a hand, yes. The burning question, why the Cape Cod motif? <laughs> the, the Cape Cod motif was referenced as a vision of what canal architecture from olden times looked like. <laughs> not, according, not according to people who live in Spencer Port or Brockport. <laughs> according to those that were making decisions and an architect that knew how to draw Cape Cod architecture. <laughs> it, I, I have read virtually word for word what I just told you. I didn't necessarily understand it. Um, maybe more appropriate would have been buildings that looked like warehouses because the canal was lined with warehouses because freight was being moved on the canal. But it's a good question. Yes. Great presentation, Bill. Uh, somewhat as a follow-up to what Al just asked, we hear in comprehensive plans of the town and the village about the character of Fairport's um, architecture and is, is something consistent with that char character. <laughs> Given your experience of um, going through all of the architectural, you know, different architectural styles, what would you say is the definition of architectural, historic architectural character of the village of Fairport? <laughs> wow. Such, such an easy question. There's, there is no answer to that. Um, you know, we, we really have such a, a mishmash of decades and centuries of architecture. And one way to illustrate that is while many buildings were lost to urban re renewal, some of the predecessors to those buildings on those same spots still exist. They were picked up and moved. Mm -hmm. yeah. For instance, on East Church Street, there are three or four structures that were moved from South Main Street. And if you imagine an early, early Fairport where little wood frame houses became storefronts and then commerce grew and the population grew and prosperity grew and the owners of those properties could build a big new building, a masonry building. Well, they saved everything. They were, they were very good at recycling. They picked up many of these structures and moved them to other places, including many that I can point out on East Church Street. So far, by the way, in the town of Parenton and the village of Fairport, we are now up to documenting 173 moved structures, from buildings to barns to outhouses. <laughs> Two outhouses, yes. Yeah, uh, Scott Winter, uh, in, in my 17 years marketing this village, 
Tourism destination marketing is a very big part of what we do. We airport sees 3,000 boat nights in that harbor in five, six months in any given year. And from a marketing perspective, what happened with this urban renewal really gave us a unique positioning among all canal towns architecturally. A, yeah, it doesn't belong here, and it's the only place you're going to find it on the canal. <laughs> B, what was really smart about it was it embraced the canal. It turned the canal in up to a, a focal point where traditionally that's a part of town you didn't want to see or go to. Yeah. So in the case of Fairport, uh, when I came here, it was already in a leadership position for, for the fact of this urban renewal efforts. So I guess it's an unintended consequence, but it's a happy one. As well. Scott makes a good point, and and to support that, if probably most of you are familiar with the Oxbow. And the Oxbow area, which had as many as 65 little cottages along the canal between A. Ralt Road and Fairport Road, backing up to the football field at Minerva Deland School. The canal was a place where in the 50s and 60s, just picking on the Oxbow, which I'm a huge fan of, those folks that lived there were passionate about where they lived. But they didn't have the support and services that everybody else had, despite the fact that they paid tax dollars on the properties that were owned there. They didn't own the land, but they owned their little structures, or someone did. No sewage capabilities whatsoever. No sewers, no septic systems. They had holding tanks, at best, where children carried buckets of waste and dump them regularly, or they had a hole in the floor. When the water was in the canal, it served to flush that east <laughs> to the village. Yeah. When there was no water in the canal in the winter, and the water came in the spring, that flush was monumental. Oh, so this is the environment of the canal prior to urban renewal where people would say, I don't want to go anywhere near the canal, except for those kids that were literally scum jumping off of the bridges. <laughs> yes? You mentioned about urban renewal still going on. Um, that multi-story uh, complex is just off, it's east of, east of Parker on the canal, on the uh, south side of the canal. I forget the name of it. On the south side, yeah. Is it what, three, four stories? How, what is it? Four canal, four, canal four side. Story. Condominiums, yes. Uh, four stories. So is that part of urban renewal? No, no, that was not. That was a purely uh, private enterprise. Um, and, you know, do you know where he's talking about? The, the big condos, not the little ones right next to the bridge. Um, in, in that example, um, I could show you a multitude of photographs, and maybe some of you worked at the old DPW that was there. Um, these photos suggest that it was pretty rough and um, very low land, pretty small area of land, and the DPW moved, and now you had this canal side property. Well, I had, I had opinions on both sides of the scale on this place, but you know what? The time has caused me to say, wow, I've met the people that live there, and I've been in those places. I do a, I do a walk with those residents every year. You've got, I think, 49 condos there, I think. Yep. Enormous uh, uh, providers to our tax um, roles. And it's kept up beautifully. And they love where they live. I can't tell you how many people who live in those condos never came to this community until they bought here. And I consider that a good thing. By the way, uh, the hawk, Pitt and Arrow, said the same thing in his essay. I embrace these people that have come to our community. Why wouldn't we want these new people to give us some new blood, new ideas, and, you know, it's grow or die, right? Hey, I'm taking up an awful lot of your time. Uh, thank you. Yeah. John, one more. Well, no, I My wife and I were urban renewed. And we live right next to Judge Wagner. Huh. And uh, he came over to us and he had a field of corn that he and Winnie had. 
and he told Patricia, for sitting up there, um, I was 19, she was 22, we were just married in 1973. And he said, I want you to go over, and I want you to pick corn, but have the water boiling, run over and throw the corn in the water, be the sweetest corn, because they explained it all to us. And uh, we never forgot that, how friendly and caring and, uh, you know, Earl's Liquor, I even went in there once in a while, you know. <laughs> and, and, oh, yeah. you know, the Keenan family and the community that we had. But, you know, it was really hard to judge when Winnie the Loser house. It was really heartbreaking. You know, I thought you were, yeah, I've been a teacher a long time. I wish I was a teacher too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming, everybody.